It's California edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. We are joined today by Marshall Tuck. He is a nominee for California State Superintendent of Public Instruction. The election's on November 4th. Here's my ballot. I voted already. You can vote by mail or vote at the polls. Mr. Tuck, I think it's fair to say you got some momentum going. Yeah, we got a lot of momentum right now, right. Brad. So uh, what is it? Why is it that you have created kind of a, a firestorm? You have every newspaper endorsement, essentially, running against a man who is not seen as someone that has been completely ineffective. Nice enough guy, but why is it that you've got that heat? Yeah, I, mean, I don't think I've created it. I think, frankly, as you and I are talking right now, there right. are two and a half million children in public schools in the state of California that cannot read and write mm -hmm. at grade level. Two and a half million. And I think most Californians know this and, and they're embarrassed by it and they're frustrated by it and know our kids can do a lot better. And I think people are really tired of a status quo in Sacramento that isn't prioritizing kids with every single decision. And so I think what this campaign really represents is it's time for major change in our schools and California can do a lot better. And I think that's what's exciting people, uh, frankly, of all shapes and sizes. What I think it may have been, and it's just me uh, as a Monday morning quarterback, is the Vagar decision. And as we know, a court ruled that California's teacher tenure rules, dismissal practices, and seniority practices were unconstitutional. It really sent a firestorm through the education establishment, and California chose to appeal that ruling. Mm -hmm. And so what have you heard on the campaign trail about this whole notion of teachers being protected essentially for life uh, after two years. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, not just California, the current state superintendent is appealing the case as well. He's a named defendant in the case. And, and when you think about how messed up things actually are, mm -hmm. we've got nine students who are filing lawsuits against the state, and we have a state superintendent whose job it is, is supposed to be to fight for kids every day and lead our education, is actually appealing and fighting against the kids in court. And this is after an independent judge, independent judge ruled in favor of the kids and said that the laws around two-year tenure and seniority-based layoffs and the dismissal statutes, that those laws shock your conscience in terms of the negative impact on kids. And so not surprisingly, as you mentioned, that's really frustrated a lot of people because... That's it, that's, uh, here's my question. I know about it. Yeah. I cover the issue. But when you're in Fresno, when you're in Redding, when you're in Bakersfield, are people aware of Vergara? They are. They, 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 are. they don't, they're not, they don't they, like Vergara doesn't resonate. The, name, say, right. the teacher tenure case, you know, the, the teacher right. layoff case. The vast majority of people of our are. Uh, I'm as you can imagine, up and down. I'm up and right. down the state every night right of now. Of course. And people are always asking, "What's your position position on this issue?" And, and my position is very clear, which is uh, I side strongly with the students. Two-year tenure is just too short. I'd like uh, to have tenure after two years. Yeah, well, I, I think about nice. it. Uh, take yeah. a new job, you're 22 right. years old, a year and a half later, because it says two years, right. you actually got to make the decision after 18 months. So at 23 and a half, hey, all right, Brad, you got a lifetime job, go to it, right? It just doesn't make sense for kids in any way, shape, or form. At the same time, you know, I'm the father of two daughters in school, and I honor our teachers. Yeah. And so how, to how do we create an environment whereby, because right now the environment is pretty toxic mm -hmm. against teachers how do we get to kind of a balanced place yeah i mean the way i think about it first of all this isn't about blaming teachers actually it's about blaming politicians i mean th these rules and laws are created by politicians mm -hmm. these rules and laws right now are supported by the current state superintendent uh, i've run two different school systems in my career in the toughest neighborhoods in la one a charter school organization mm -hmm. one traditional public schools and there's no question the most important thing Supporting your teachers, right. lifting your teachers up. The largest financial investment we made every single year was in teacher training and teacher support, right, with our discretionary dollars. So you have to invest heavily. And, and frankly, we're never going to get to California being a great state again in education until we substantially lift up the teaching profession and support our teachers. But I actually tell people laws like two year tenure. And laws that say if there are layoffs, they're only done based on seniority, they're not mm -hmm. done based on performance, those laws aren't just bad for kids, they're actually bad for teachers mm -hmm. because it decreases the profession. And frankly, if you're a young person who's thinking about what career to go into, do you take a job where you could be great at your job and get fired five years later because somebody else who's not good at all their job just has been there for two or three more years than mm -hmm. you? You don't, and that's why you see a lot of people just not going into so the profession. So presuming you are victorious, what happens with Vergara as an example. Yeah. I mean, let's say you win and Governor Brown wins. I mean, he also chose to appeal the ruling. So if you win, then what happens? Well, I can only control what I can control. So okay. what I win, first day in office, we're pulling the appeal from the state superintendent on Vergara. Okay. State superintendent's a named defendant. I'll be the state superintendent. We're going to pull appeal. We're also going to submit documents to the court saying we strongly support both the 
facts of the case, right. as well as it's much better educationally for kids. So what's its replacement? I, I, I yeah. guess even kind of as a parliamentary matter, what happens next? Well, that's, so next is yeah. we convene superintendents from up and down okay. the state. We convene academics from the university system. This is what the state superintendent should be doing. And we right. say, okay, what makes sense going forward for tenure? I don't think you get rid of it altogether. It right. should be longer. should be harder to get to. And frankly, after you have tenure, if you just really go south in your job, you still, right. still should be able to be removed. When we think about layoffs, we shouldn't have to have layoffs, but if we do have to have them, they should be made based on performance, not based on seniority. So we bring together uh, actually true leaders in the field and say, let's put forward what we think should be the answers on tenure, and then you push that through the legislature for more changes. So that's the key. You've yeah. got to get to the legislature. Absolutely. Where does the Teachers Association land on this? Because we know they've been big supporters yeah. of the status quo. Well, I mean, they have, they, the teachers union has to have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. uh, but right now, that seat's too big. Uh, the, the biggest seat should be parents and kids. Right, that should be the biggest seat. But the teachers union has to be a partner. I've only worked in, in schools that are unionized and they have to have a voice, right. but it can't be the only voice. I think what you're seeing right now is uh, they're aligning with the state superintendent. It's the only voice actually fighting against the Vergara case. So at this stage, the only criteria is, criterion is seniority. Mm -hmm. You want to bring in other criteria, which many do. What would they be? Yeah, so I, I kind of always look at my experience in schools, right. right? So we took over the lowest performing schools in Los Angeles and we said, let's have multiple measures uh, to evaluate our teachers, not just our teachers, by the way, our principals. Right. Because that's what you got to make sure you're evaluating sure. first and foremost. And also, in my job, I was evaluated based on multiple measures. Right. So step one is, the if you're talking about a teacher, observations from a principal or assistant principal. Okay. And we always kind of looked at it, that was about half of what your evaluation would be. You set up clear criteria for quality teaching right. observations. Secondly, as we looked at student data right. and student achievement, particularly around growth. So if a student started with a teacher, at the end of the year, where were they and what was the improvement? And then you actually use so that, that for, that's the for key, student is, achievement is data. not so much, because in some ways, if you compare one classroom yeah. versus another, a teacher may have just Receive smarter kids yeah, versus you, not you, as ha you have to look at, at kind of the the va the, ad, the value add right. during that year from a teacher, and you compare it across classes. So if you and I both teach, you know, high poverty kids, let's see what the what the success was of those kids' improvement. But and how do we get that. to a place where we're not so driven on these standardized test scores? Well, I think the key is you don't make it a majority. So I, we always thought about twenty five percent, thirty three mm -hmm. percent. So we, when I talk about multiple measures, most important was observation from your principal or assistant principal, then you look at student achievement growth, then we looked at what we also called contributions to school community. So if you were a teacher who took extra time to go coach your peers, that would be a part of your evaluation. If you were a teacher who went above and beyond, you know, had your leadership class and kind of put hours and hours in addition to your teaching, you get a quality evaluation there. So I don't believe student achievement data is the majority of an evaluation. I think it should be less than 50%, but it needs to be a meaningful portion of it. And, and lastly, I think yeah. you leave that up to local school districts. I don't want, I don't want Sacramento dictating right. what the formula should be. Which actually begs the question, because as you know, we have what's now called the local control funding yeah. formula, which devolves power to local districts. And so how do you... Sure, we want local control, but how do you create at least some uniformity? Because a teacher in Reading, you yeah. know, you want them to be evaluated at least at a similar standard to a teacher in Riverside. No. Well, I think what the state needs to do is, is define, hey, what are the like, what are the frameworks and what are the best practices, right? And then you actually then allow teachers and principals and superintendents, those that are closest to kids, to make the final decisions. And even though we have local control funding formula right now. That only gives local control for a s certain amount of dollars. It doesn't give local control for evaluation. No, that's true. It doesn't give local control for your curriculum. It doesn't give local control for staffing. So a lot of times you'll hear my opponent and other mm -hmm. st members of the education status quo say, oh, we've already given local control. No, no, no. Some local control on money, but nothing close in terms of curriculum, staffing, in terms of thinking about how you're actually leveraging evaluation technology. But I think the state's job should be not to tell you what to do, but to actually say, here's what's working in other school districts. And what I found, if you're doing your job and you're working hard, and you hear somebody else who's doing the same job you have and they're doing it really well, and someone makes it easy for you to learn what they're doing, you're probably gonna go and figure that out. And that's why I think the state shouldn't be telling you what to do, but should be giving you a lot of empowerment so you can have creativity, innovation, but then also sharing best practices. But that being said, if you're not getting the job done, the state needs to intervene. And, and that's where there's another lawsuit right now where the state's not, not doing that. And they, they gotta step in when kids aren't successful. Election day, November 4th. My name is Brad Pomerantz. His name is Marshall Tuck. He's a nominee for state superintendent. It's California edition.